Blockchain Brad speaking and today I wanted to talk to you about some really cool stuff um, and I really don't want to waste too much time because it's going to take me a bit to get through it. So the main focus of this talk today is on POW, proof of work, POS, proof of stake and a really cool one called the DBFT which I'm going to get to later which is to me the most exciting one so stay tuned to find out more about what the DBFT is and why it's the one to absolutely invest in in the future and a cousin of it, which I'll also give a little hint in at the end. Okay, so the big question today raising the debates of the past is the BOW um, or the POS. So whether or not the proof of work is the way to go, whether the proof of stake in any of the blockchains that you may be considering investing in or perhaps buying into the market via an ICO slash um, company that wants to append to that blockchain. Okay, so let's just get down to it. Um, you can see on the screen that there's a bloke named or a guy named Ivan. He is well respected in the crypto community and even the Michael from Box Mining, he's been um, and interviewed him. So uh, full cred and respect to you, Ivan, and I will certainly leave a link to you below. Um, I listened to you carefully. So this is for anyone who wants to know a bit about it. Basically, I've summed it up. I've made some notes today. And the thing I wanted to just get across is that proof of work, there's a main objective. And what that is, is essentially um, those in who are pro POW, um, the idea is to append a block to formulate blocks uh, so that you can uh, essentially have a release of coins. So as you know, Bitmain and many other major players in China, they're really big on trying to um, trying to assert their dominance in the mining space. But what that does essentially is that it means that the lay uh, consumer of cryptos, they don't really have access to that kind of uh, the major uh, mining activity or uh, ma ma I guess revenue generation. So the costs involved in mining anyway are quite high. Um, it was even quoted with um, McAfee saying that it costs about a thousand bucks US to mine a, a, bit, a Bitcoin at the moment. Um, but essentially, how the POW works is that um, there's an there's a as a puzzle or an enigma that has to be solved, a cryptographic enigma. And if that's done via the major electricity power that's generated in that in trying to hash that out, what happens is uh, the rewards are allocated via the the um, via the the, crypt, the cryptocurrency uh, reward of the coin itself. Um, and that's obviously beneficial in markets where the cost um, obviously of the mining itself is far less than the, re the reward of the coin. At the moment, uh, Bitcoin is certainly the case, but there are very few that can compete. And that's perhaps why there's a major concern for the POW model, because um, mining rights and mining voting power underpins the POW model. Okay, now talking briefly about the POS model, it's so different in that it's all about validators, as Ivan's explained, and a few others, as well as Michael from Block, Box Mining. It's about validators, and how it works there is that um, essentially you're locking up a stake or a, a, a collection or a group of shares. And you do this because it allows you to validate the ledger that is, that is the blockchain that you're invested in. And... It's, uh, as Ivan's explained, it's a bit like betting in that you're trying to bet that, um, on the, on that, that it will append to the blockchain itself. And by doing that, you receive a dividend. Now, there are many ways that different POS models are doing that, but um, NEO itself is actually not a POS model. And so if I've confused anybody in previous po podcasts, I'm going to really clear that up today. So really, the objective firstly is just to separate the differences between the POW and the POS uh, algorithmic uh, computational models so that you can see whether or not that you can understand them firstly and see whether or not you think that they're best beneficial for investment in the future. I certainly have my own opinion and I'll definitely get to that at the end. Okay, so the PO, de, POS model, what it does is it nullifies and negates computational costs because you no longer have to go and do that cryptographic um, search or that you don't have to go and try and solve any particular cryptographic um, problem uh, via high energy costs. Instead, you can simply just, uh, via the POS model, you can simply stake your position 
um, and you stake your holding of a particular token, um, and it would it in itself should generate its own uh, rewards by, by doing that. Now, who is doing that? Well, we need to talk really carefully about this. The main player that I think is worth talking about is Ethereum. It's a major blockchain. Sorry, a block. It's a major blockchain in the game, um, and perhaps one of the best uh, POS models to talk about. But there are some negatives to talk about in this as well. So I want to just touch on what Ivan has said, in that, and I found some evidence to support it. So I'll just go across to that. Um, I found a, a post by T. T plus D. And if you look carefully in this post, you'll see that Vitalik Buterin has actually stated in his own words that there's going to be an initial 1,000 Ethereum requisite for participation in the POS or proof of stake uh, contributions. That's really concerning. And that's because what that does is that it, it means that people like like me, for example, who doesn't have a thousand Ethereum in my wallet, I can't actually go and participate in that POS initially. And whilst that is going to change in the future, and there's every expectation that Ethereum will uh, in enable uh, a minimum of 10 uh, Ethereum to, be, to become staked, um, what, it, what it does raise is a major concern about um, access to what is to be, what is supposed to be a decentralized uh, model, an open source model. By denying the lay person to participate in the POS, what it actually does is it challenges that very precept or that concept that underpins the ideology that Vitalik's a fan of, and that is that decentralized peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, exchange model that is supposed to open up markets and, and open up, you know, uh, currency exchange um, as well as, you know, uh, utility and uh, stock exchange at some point. So in that sense, it is um, a one negative or drawback that I would ra wanted to raise, and I wanted to make sure that there are um, you can see some evidence from Vitalik himself that that is a concern. Okay, so just moving on to the POS algorithm pros or the benefits. Um, it's fantastic if you want to compare the two because it's much faster in that it doesn't, as I said, doesn't require the cryptographic puzzle um, resolution or uh, uh, computational uh, like problem solving um, to, in order to validate the process of, um, I guess, uh, addressing the consensus issues. Um, so in that sense, faster processes means faster opt uptake. And that's only going to benefit any blockchain that supports a POS model. Uh, the, one of the other benefits that Ivan also raised, um, and I agree with him, is that it's a it's great for security. And that's number the number one reason for that is because if you use a POW model, what can happen is a malicious um, or dark you know ent a malicious user um, who's likely to be a uh, someone quite wealthy. They, oh, excuse me for a second. Um, Lee, can you just turn that off? Um, sorry, that was just my daughter. Just got a um, an alarm going off for my pool. <laughs> so I'm just getting back to this. Um, yeah. So if if you have someone who is of you know who has a lot of money behind them, they are, uh, I guess, you know, a high roller in terms of, and no pun intended, but in in the stakes of the crypto game, what they could do is they could try and grab a hold of more than 50% of the hashing power of any particular blockchain. And if they did that, then they essentially would be able to control things like double spending, history, and they just have too much con control and market manipulation potential. And so I'm really not a big fan of that. Again, that goes against the complete grain um, uh, or, or ideological grain of the uh, decentralized blockchain itself, and I think it poses too much risk also for the investor. So, one of the things that uh, Ethereum did to combat this concern when they designed their POS model was they also came up with this idea that Ivan, Ivan has mentioned, and that's called the nothing at stake uh, 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 solution. And it's a solution because what they've done is they've also made sure that if you are going to 
um, stake your worth in a particular blockchain or in Ethereum specifically, you can only do that once in, in, in terms of its history. You can only do it with Ethereum. So you can't try and, you know, utilize other blockchains and try and stake multiple times. Um, that would not be advantageous for Ethereum and that's why they've done it. So, you know, let's just recash. There's three benefit, major benefits, and that is it's faster through the algorithm. It's a, it provides better security, and it also it it means that okay. Ethereum also benefits from the investment, which is obviously an important thing. You want it to be um, a reciprocal arrangement, and also it does afford you some um, degree of voting power, which it sets forth a more democratic model, perhaps than the proof of work. Okay, so. The POS, again, it, what I really like about it as well is that it removes that um, potential for manipulation and misuse. Um, it also, it sort of stops mining pool monopolies. And as you know, they're predominant in China. Bitmain's a great example, and they would no doubt be shaking in their boots at the idea of a POS. But of course, Bitmain, Bitmain essentially don't care. And perhaps that, well, that's where they've erred in their name, because whether it be Bitcoin or bit anything or some other coin, they're going to simply look for the optimal mining position. And that could be with Zcash, it could be with PIVX, whatever it is in the future, but there's no question that they essentially probably aren't that worried because there's always gonna be mining pools, there's always gonna be um, coins to mine, and there's always going to be currencies that uh, afford that kind of um, opportunity through the POW model. The only thing is, the question will be whether or not the lay public realise that and switch make switches that don't benefit the miners. So again, the POS model really is moving away from this ironically centralised um, model that certainly Jamie Dimon would approve of, of you know, um, miners having a monopoly or having um, a, an ability to dictate markets because that, that really is much like you know, a bank structure, or, or the, it was evolving to become that. Um, so yeah, one of the major perks is that it also, um, it prevents, you know, the, if for want of a better analogy, it prevents pirates, cyber pirates, from stealing uh, the, the, the ultimate treasure. What I really love is that there will be a penalty imposed upon that through the POS model, in that Quite simply, and this is really important and maybe haven't been clear, uh, a, a crypto pirate of any kind is going to risk their entire stake, their entire holding in any particular um, blockchain because with this POS model, um, the, the arbitrators or the, the governance behind it can actually with, withdraw that stake. So they, they risk losing everything and they would have to pay with their treasure. <laughs> Again, poor analogy. Okay, let's move on to some really cool stuff. Um, just moving on a couple of things that I was looking at. So essentially what this article that I found here, um, I'll just move up and show you where it was from. The title is Ethereum's Big Switch, The New Roadmap to Proof of Stake. What I really liked is that they talked about virtual mining and I've made some notes on that as well. So let's move into that. So talking about Casper, Casper's been on in the planning for about two years. I'll just have a bit of coffee as we get going. And basically, um, with the help of Vlau, they are working really hard to try and implement this revolutionary tech um, being the POS model. And they're going to do it this way. They're going to do it, um, as you can see on the screen, in stages. And Vitalik is the proponent of this, and Vlau is not. Um, and I can understand why, but it's kind of like a hybridized way of integrating the POS model. So gradually, um, they're going to do so by first releasing one out of every 100 blocks. And that's why initially there is this minimum requisite of a 1,000 Ether to participate in the POS. And because in Vitalik's mind, that is the best way to cater for this, you know, this transition from the POW or proof of work model. Okay, so why is this cool? Well, it's cool because there's, um, you know, there's By Byzantine and Metropolis coming. And that's going to benefit the market because it's basically virtualized, virtual, virtualizing money and it's removing the whole mining uh, debacle and um, monopoly or potential for monopoly from the whole vir uh, cryptocurrency equation. 
And that's really important because Casper is going to evolve into, I would imagine, its own tradable value or store of value. Um, and that's um, going to also perhaps um, be something in which uh, investors can benefit from as the POS is implemented into Ethereum. So continue, keep thinking about uh, Casper, uh, keep thinking about the benefits of Ethereum. It's not going anywhere. Uh, in fact, I would, uh, I would be, I'm very confident in saying that I think that Ethereum is going to really be bolstered by this um, and it's going to challenge Bitcoin in the future you know, for various reasons. Okay, so check that out if you get a chance, guys. I found that really useful. Um, the next article I want to talk to you about was by Michael, a legend in the um, YouTube world. <laughs> and yeah, shout out to you, Michael. I was actually briefly having a chat with you last night when you were live streaming. You don't know me, but I'm a big fan. And he released an article called Proof of Work versus Proof of Stake. And it's really been simplified for everybody, which I really like. And he just goes in to explain much of what I've said in, in how it works. So I don't really want to go and rehash everything, no pun intended, but it's really just to um, illuminate that there's a lot of people who want to know the answer to these questions and Michael's a great person to go to if you want to know a bit more about that. Uh, but as I said before, and he alludes to this here, he talks about Dash and Pivx and I like this um, because it basically explains a few different uh, cryptos and how some of them are divided differently with the POW and POS models. I'm not a fan of those divisions and that's why Ethereum is moving from you know, transitioning to 100% POS because it's never really that, good of, uh, that great of a thing in the, um, in the long term to have a uh, really any kind of POW model in my opinion, and this is only mine, because it really um, dilutes the consensus potential of a particular blockchain or it challenges the consensus rather. So yeah, thanks Michael and check that out. Now another one I want to talk to you about guys was really recent, it was only released yesterday. Roger Ver, Max Kaiser, Charles Hoskinson were, and a few other people, Sal included, were at the Nexus conference and I watched the whole thing. It, um, uh, via YouTube and it was really really interesting and controversial in many ways Roger Ver just recently is just really ticking the controversy box um, for many reasons he's pro B, uh, BCC as many people will be aware and I'm starting to understand a lot as to why that is and I would expect BCC to actually rise in value for that reason um, again no uh, financial advice from me I don't actually hold any Bitcoin um, uh, I have stakes in in, in other uh, up and coming uh, blockchains that I think are much better anyway. Okay, so the reason why I'm talking about this one is because I'm just going to um, briefly mention. I won't I won't play it, but if you want to see it, check out uh, one one hour four minutes and six seconds because that's when they specifically address um, the question posed about Ethereum uh, moving into the POS model. Um, with Casper being, you know, implemented um, presently, and their response is very interesting, and uh, and I think it's something to heed in, in term for all investors out there. Their response was um, basically re um, consider Ethereum Classic as one uh, one token that is going to support most likely. Or rather, it's going to benefit from the Casper implementation. And I say that only as speculation based on the inferences of these guys who are much more qualified than me because they were inferring that perhaps that's where the mining is going to transition to. If that's the case, you can only imagine, um, just like BCC is in um, a phase of valorized transition because of the mining issue, I think you're going to see Cla uh, Ethereum Classic rise in value because a lot of the miners are going to shift across um, well, that's certainly what Charles was inferring through this. So check that out. I found it quite interesting myself. Um, but again, I tend to invest in a, a different um, algorithmic model than by either POW or POS, and I'm going to talk about that really soon. Okay, so moving across to the next one. So why is it that, um, you know, these consensus systems are so important to talk about. Well, basically, the reason is because if we don't have the conversation now about how an, uh, blockchains um, establish consensus, then we are missing the entire cryptocurrency boat. Um, 
seriously, we're going to be left on the on the on the dock wondering what we missed. And it's because if you if the algorithmically if algorithmically if they don't get this right, or if they don't have the one that's cutting edge in a market that's you know exp as exponential and as explosive as cryptos, then they really aren't going to cater for um, the the potential that's out there for everyone as uh, in, in uh, simply as a functionality. So. POS, one of the cool things that they are doing um, is to, uh, as you can see on the screen, um, the alternatives are uh, slow, expensive, blah, 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 subject to collusion, as I've mentioned. So check out this site. Uh, it was really, really cool. I really liked it. Um, essentially, they talk about, uh, it comes from a site called Daily Fintech. So anything, anytime you hear Fintech, you're going to pay attention. And they were just addressing some of the issues with both POW and POS, um, and as I said before, it illuminates some of the issues to do with them, but what they did also talk about was masternodes, and masternodes are basically the way in which stakes, uh, your stake is locked up um, so that it can improve the overall um, connectivity um, of, of the uh, whole blockchain, and that's you know, at the end of the day, that's all coming down to uh, better functionality and better speeds, which is, again, going to be paramount to everything because it's about making sure that, you know, you're investing in the best um, transactional or the most, the, the, a blockchain that has some, some of the best transactional value in terms of its speeds and, and capacity. Okay. So, um, as Michael had bro was broaching before, there's a few examples. You've got Dash. 50-50 uh, uh, with the POS and the POW, PVX 100. Now, NEO is one that uh, initially when I was doing my research, um, to be honest, my assumption was it was a POS model because you have gas and, you know, I thought, I figured, well, that makes sense. Um, you're staking gas, so therefore it's a POS. It's actually not. Um, it is so much better than that. And I'm going to talk to you about how, why that is and what that is, um, which will be coming up really soon in this talk. Let's move on. Okay, let's go to one of the best articles that I actually found, and I'm going to go straight to it, uh, and it's here. Now, Neo uh, Smart Economy by the, the Neo Blockchain Twitter posted something recently, and I just will read this out directly. They say that the Byzantine alternative, which is the proof of work versus proof of stake, is not a black and white issue. Now, that in itself simply means that we need to look at something else. And I, I didn't really get it. I thought, okay, well, I don't, don't really know what that means. So I looked and dug a bit deeper. And many of you will know, I'm certainly a novice in the crypto world, but I'm only providing this because I am a huge, huge fan of NEO. I've invested um, in whatever I could afford in NEO. And it's because of this. Now, here we go. There is what's arguably a crucial flaw of both POW and POS in that both of them represent, you know, multiple, um, uh, they, or they evidence throughout, you know, the crypto uh, space and and since its evolution and inception via Bitcoin, there's been this, this problem with forking. So this amazing article called the Byzantine Alternative, what it did was it raised some very key points an altern and, and an alternative to the even the POS model. So... It, it, the, the name for it, for this alternative, because of the, the, the crucial flaw of the forking potential of, of even the, PO, the POS model, which, you know, it, it's potentiated in the future as well with Ethereum, there's this new thing that's come out, and it's called, I'm going to just make sure I've got it right, it's called the Distributed Byzantine General Fault Tolerance Algorithm. Now, it's, a, it's an absolute bloody mouthful, but it is a freaking amazing uh, algorithmic that black like protocol that is really truly revolutionizing how um, consensus nodes are adopted in, and interact with each other and support the overall ecosystem. So if you you know you hear Da Hong Fei talking about ecosystems, and when you understand just the DBGFT, you understand how valuable this algorithm is because it's unforkable at well it's alleged to be, and it's certainly looking at the algorithmic nature of it. When you know that, it all makes a lot of sense. And I'm going to go and explain that in a moment. So just remember that uh, 
there is a crucial flaw in the POW and POX in that the, it's the forking issue. And this particular article that I'm looking at in front of me that you can see on screen, it explains this. So I can't you know, encourage you more than go and check out this article. Um, but you can just go Google Biosyntone alternative and you'll find it. Okay, so one of the values, um, the great values of this new model is that it, it even though there is this uh, current research happening with Vitalik doing plasma and there's some, even StreamX is a, a pending to that I understand, um, even with all the efforts going on for, to increase uh, transactional speeds, the truth is that at, at present day in 2017, in September, the transactional capacity and capabilities of Ethereum really don't even come close. They're not even on par with Visa yet. However, the system that I'm um, I'm, all, I'm a big fan of, the this new one that is the distributed Byzantine General's Fault Tolerance system, um, algorithm, it actually will provide a much better capacity to compete with those kind of speeds. So again, investment in the in, in terms of blockchain, investment should all be about the potential in transactional val um, speed and uh, in, uh, like capacity to into, to adopt real world uh, uh, technologies via this these just transactional capacity and in my opinion those blockchains that adopt the DBG FT are those that are actually the most competitive and leading the way throughout the world in blockchain development. Okay, so definitely one. Or something to take note of and, and even make notes and go and check out your information. It's just going to help you as an investor so much more to know this stuff, certainly helping me. Um, okay, so as I said before, the solution to the forking POW and POS forking risk is to switch over to something that's called a DBFT. Now, the big question, okay, I've explained a little bit about who the D, what the DBFT is, it's super exciting to me, but I want to know immediately who is using this? And the answer is, of course, no surprises to all of the listeners, is NEO. NEO run a distributed Byzantine General's fault tolerance algorithm, and what it, its core function is to describe, sorry, to describe the and address the inherent problems of node consensus in in the POS model. And how they do that is really cool. Uh, what they do is they have uh, professional node operators and you can think of these guys as bookkeepers and what they do is they basically oversee the over um, the ecosystem and they oversee the usage within the blockchain itself and they basically um, they negate and circumvent the forking by um, having a requisite of two-thirds of consensus within those professional nodes. So what that means is that there are, there's even a chairman node. It just means that there's um, a smaller number of, um, I guess, nodes that operate the overall uh, block, blockchain ecosystem. Or they're more like the overseers. Of it. And that's such a major change to the way in which the POS model is designed um, because at the end of the day, value is in... Um, circumventing the forking issue, value is in trying to uh, stabilize our market and to and and most importantly from that increase transactional speed, and that's exactly what this particular algorithm does, and that's what Neo runs in, runs on. So that's why it's worth learning much more about Neo, because if Neo is doing that, and as I've said in previous videos. They are doing some incredible things when it comes to um, enterprise uh, in terms of private structure, uh, private alliances. They are the real deal. They're the real shit when it comes to blockchain um, of 2017. Okay, just a couple more notes. I'm sorry if I've gone on, but I just found this info to be so good. So the question has to be asked, so why is DBFT a massive deal? Well, quite simply, there are two major, one major player and one that's starting to come to the fore now. Neo and Hyperledger are two great examples of blockchains that are using the DBF, the DBTF. Um, and Neo's main objective is actually to digitalize the real world securities like shares and bonds. And if you can imagine right now how, how valuable shares and bonds are throughout the world, then you can understand the magnanimity of this particular algorithm. This enables 
okay? This enables that kind of digitalization of securities. And POS simply doesn't do that as easily, if at all. So that's the objective and that's the direction and targets that NEO's going for. And they are already making gains in the real world. That's their big mantra as well. So when you've got evidence, when you've got um, governmental backing, whether it be albeit indirect via on-chain, NEO is at the forefront right now um, with the right kind of tech and the right kind of uh, movement and momentum uh, in the real world. I can't talk about Hyperledger. I don't really know that much about it, but I would be watching that one very keenly because you know they're using um, some really important algorithms for to, as a model. Okay. Um, finally, I guess I just wanted to uh, address, I'll go across to a post I found. Um, and, oh, well, before I do this, there's an excellent website here. I will just wanted to, it, it, and again, it just explains uh, what the blockchain project and how NEO, which is, as you can see, Ant shares here, explains the reasons for choosing the DBFT over the POW and the POS. So it's an unreal uh, article and really informative. Um, again, I just simply didn't know what the DBFT was and I heard a lot about the POS and now I understand that if I didn't do this research, I'd be left behind because there's just so much, it's just so much better. And you really want to be investing, I think, in, in the best tech because the best tech is going to give you the best dividend because it's going to have the best adoption and the best uptake in the real world. So check out that, that info, but I want to show you right now another thing that I found really, really important, um, and that is, yes, here it is. I wanted to just simply um, share with you this, what you can see in front of you in the picture of this guy. His name is Zen Zen Wang, and he is the co-founder and co-developer of NEO. And I will even highlight the information for you, but he basically said, uh, well, I'll just read you what I've written. He said that the DBFT alternative is the best is best suited to the blockchain industry, and these are the reasons why he said it. He said because one, it provides swifter transactions; two, it de it's a, it provides disincentives for cyber attacks and blockchain misuse through its guaranteed whole um, whole stack. Um, so by guaranteeing whole stack losses of, of malicious users, and three, um, it's a, it's riskless to forking. Now, uh, or it's it's forking neutral. I guess you could. There's another way to look at it. Um, and the other thing to remember, to note as well is that um, it it uh, it's it's capacity or its algorithm in terms of node consensus is different, and that's fundamental to its success as an algorithm that's being used by NEO. Um, because at the end of the day, you want to have voting rights, but you certainly don't want to uh, play around with the algorithm so that um, it can potentiate a fork, which is what you know, BC is in, very infamous for and will continue to be a problem because it's simply just modeled on the wrong, wrong thing for present day. You know, it's old tech. So that was super exciting. And if that couldn't be more exciting, this is something I just want to finish off with to just as a cherry. When I was doing research, I wanted to know if there was something I'd missed in terms of future developments, um, out, you know, above, above and beyond DBFT. And what I learned is that Icon, the Icon Foundation, which is essentially a neo-like um, ecosystem that is forming and developing in South Korea, it has its very own uh, algorithm as well, and not the BFT. And I was very, very interested in this because I've actually invested in the pre-sale. I think it's that amazing. And I, I've never invested in a pre-sale and I probably won't in many, but this one was just so impressive. So I just I translated a few of these links from Korean, you know, just through Google. And I learned that in, in the information I found, there was this company called LoopChain. And LoopChain basically is a bit like on-chain, you know, for NEO in that it underpins what the Icon Foundation stands for. And if you look further than, deeper than that, um, and I'll try and highlight it here, I found out that the consensus algorithm used by this company is called LFT. And it even says, if you look here, it says it's similar to the agreement system of DBFT, which is adopted by NEO. Now, I just want to sort of raise the question here, 
if NEO is the success that it is and it will and continues to be, then one can only imagine if there's a similar model happening in China with uh, sorry South Korea with a similar uh, uh, um, economic um, climate and a sim similar cryptocurrency environment, then surely that's worth heeding and investigating because I know that I'm le looking into Icon as much as possible because I think it is an absolute, you know, it's absolute gold for blockchain future or for the, for the blockchain industry itself. So to help out with that, I found another site called The Loop and it just reinforces what I was saying in that it is the L LFT algorithm and it's called the Loop Chain Fault Tolerance Algorithm and it tells you a little bit about um, how it works and I'm yet to understand it all completely, but I love the fact that it is moving away from even the POS model. Um, so finally, I wanted to just show you, to reinforce this, um, there's a site here uh, that was written, that pro uh, produced by Icon themselves, which is the South Korean uh, NEO, for, you know, and I don't really even like saying that, but it's the best analogy I can give you. They explained what it is, check them out, um, they don't have a lot of English um, marketing yet, which is a bit of a problem for them, but there could be a reason for that. Um, but check out the bottom one, it explains uh, basically the core technology. And if you look here, you'll see that they use the loop chain fault tolerance algorithm based real time transactional support. And there's other cool things about it, um, but yeah, an absolute winner, cracker of an ICO and a cracker of a blockchain technology. Um, so that ends the discussion on the um, FOW, FOS and the DBFT for today. Um, let me know what you thought. I'm, this is my website. Um, oh, sorry, this is my YouTube. I've only just started like yesterday and I, I'm a big fan of talking about uh, blockchains that I think are you know, up and coming or are uh, basically backed by the best tech and you can see that so far I've been a bit obsessed with Neo but you know I'm trying to do a bit of research and I will continue to do some on others and I've sort of alluded to that with Icon. Um, if you're a bit of a Twitter fan you can check me out at Brad's Blockchain. I've tried to make it really specific. I've worked on a little bit recently to be able to interact sort of just in the crypto space because it's, it's where I want to be at, at the moment. Um, yeah, and finally, check out the prices of Neo. They're moving. I, I posted a podcast yesterday, and I said that uh, around at this point that I there was a lot there was a propensity for it to head up for various reasons. But I also want to plug a a, a guy named Tyler Swope, or AKA Crypt, the Crypto Chico. Now, if you haven't subscribed to this guy. Definitely do. I'll say it again. Tyler Swope is his YouTube name, Swope, S-W-O-P-E, because one of the things that he raised, and I'll finish off with this tip, is that if you don't know already, Korea are um, exchanging NEO, and that's perhaps one of the reasons why this sudden rise, and it will fall again as well, but it will continue up. It's on an upswing for sure, but it's important to note that it's likely to continue with a significant uh, bull run because within the month, um, of October, it's going. Neo is going to be tradable on mobiles in South Korea. And if anyone knows anything about South Korea, you'll know that South Korea don't muck around when it comes to trading, whether it be security or crypto or whatever. And if you can trade on your phone, you are basically holding the bloodline of cryptocurrencies, and it's accessible. Uh, and you can be on the train from work, and you can go and trade at your will. So that's it from me. Uh, blockchain Brad. I hope you've enjoyed this um, this very long-winded um, post and I'm uh, really keen to hear your feedback. But yeah, go Neo and uh, I'm signing out. Cheers.